Hello and welcome to Pulmonology Read Aloud. This is Dr. Ansham Aneja Arora and I am back with a video in the OSA series on pharmacological treatment in obstructive sleep apnea. In my last video, we discussed about the palm classification of endotypes of obstructive sleep apnea, which described how various pathological mechanisms may determine if a patient has obstructive sleep apnea. This helps us to understand that CPAP may not be the only treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, and that also explains why some people never improve even with CPAP therapy. So let's talk about the pharmacological treatment in OSA today. The paper that I've referred to today is an open access paper in Frontiers in Sleep, which was published in September 2023. So what is an OSA phenotype? We did discuss about certain endotypes. So those attributes or those meaningful traits in a patient with OSA that distinguish one from another will be a phenotype. For instance, Patients with high HI versus low HI, patients with high oxygen desaturation index or hypoxemia versus the ones who do not have much of desaturation, patients who respond to CPAP who do not respond, male versus females, overlap syndrome, patient with comorbidities, patient with position-associated OSA, and so on and so forth. When we discussed the last video, I did show this slide which talks about how phenotypes can be divided in obstructive sleep apnea. And we realize that there are certain people who will have excessive daytime sleepiness as a predominant complaint, which has to be probably tackled separately. There may be patients who are not obese. There may be patients who are HI is not very high. And so the benefit of CPAP may vary. So if we know the phenotypes, we will be able to cater individual tailored treatment to them. If we talk about pharmacological approaches, this paper talks about the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that have been published. The evidence taken in this paper is on the RCTs that have been published for each pharmacological treatment. And after all the discussion, they have concluded that acetazolamide is the only drug that has been shown in proper studies to reduce AHI significantly. They have also come to a bottom conclusion that pharmacotherapy is not standalone as a treatment of OSA. And so the message going out after this video is that it can still be added for a lot of people. Having said that, this paper does not discuss about tirzepatide, which is a new drug, a new oral drug for obstructive sleep apnea, which acts by ways of stimulating the muscles. This paper was published in 23 at the time. Um, it was This drug was yet not approved by FDN. Probably that's why they haven't taken it. But I will be soon making a video on this new oral drug for obstructive sleep apnea, which has been approved now by FDA for mild and moderate obstructive sleep apnea. So when we talk about the classical agents that have been evaluated, for OSA, they include drugs promoting wakefulness, which affect the arousal threshold. Also, drugs targeting the arousal threshold directly. Drugs which work on the M of the palm, that is muscle activity, and drugs that work on the L of the palm classification, which is which affect loop gain. Essentially, if we talk about drugs affecting muscular activity, there are new additions to it, such as I mentioned the drug tirzepatide, which may be available very soon. If we talk about a loop gain target, the maximum uh, studies and randomized controlled trials have been in this category. And um, this includes studies on not only acetazolamide, but also a newer drug called Salthian. Now, if we add on the total RCTs, there are significant RCTs with uh, one being conducted in almost 68 patients with moderate and severe OSA who could not tolerate CPAP treatment. 
But the problem here is that most of these studies have been done for short duration, for instance, for four weeks. But there have been reports that they help reduce the AHI from 55 to 33 events per hour by giving uh, sulthium in the dose of 400 milligrams. And even if it is given in the lower dose of 200 milligram, there has been a drop in events from 61 to 40 events per hour. So uh, definitely bringing down AHI by more than 20 events per hour, which is one of the strongest reductions in drug trial in OSA. Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Um, so what this will do is it will instill metabolic acidosis. So what this drug will do is that it will increase the patient's baseline ventilation. And when the patient's baseline ventilation increases, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide changes. Um, the patient is able to flush off CO2 more from the system and the loop gain is affected. The new drug, Saltiam, is definitely one that is on the horizon. And the side effects of these usually include polyuria, dysgeusia, paresthesias, and fatigue. The second uh, system that we can target is the one which involves arousal threshold. And this is because we know that respiratory vent-related arousals cause a lot of breathing instability. So any patient who has a low arousal threshold, there will be more breathing instability, and that will be an important predictor of OSA severity. So we can decrease AHI in some OSA patients especially those where there's no significant severe hypoxemia uh, and they have a low or moderate arousal threshold. And classically, the benzodiazepines and the Z drugs have been used in it. Um, 10 milligrams of zolpidem has been found to increase the arousal threshold and also promote a positive effect in the genioglossus. So what do we do here? We use drugs which are either from benzodiazepine family or the Z-drug family. Also, trazodone and pimavancidin are two other drugs. In the benzodiazepines, which are GABA A receptor agonists, arousal threshold is affected. There is no significant effect on AHI reduction, but it has been shown that there is a, a partial reduction, even if not statistically significant. The problem here is that most of the studies you see are one-night studies. Only the Z-drugs, the studies have been done for around four weeks, which is still not a very long period to talk about effectivity. However, they still remain as a viable alternative for patients where you feel arousal threshold may be affected. The other category of the drugs are the ones that target upper airway dilatory muscles, and these include those that have noradrenergic reuptake inhibition and antimuscarinic agents. Now, what happens is that when we talk about the upper airway dilatory muscles, two important phenomena contribute to the collapse. One is that there could be a sleep-related withdrawal of the endogenous noradrenergic drive. And when there is no drive, then genioglossus has hypotonia. And this can happen in both non-REM and REM sleep. Also, the other thing can be an active muscuranic inhibition, which induces hypotonia in these muscles. So when we give anti-muscurinics and when we give noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors, we may promote upper airway muscle activity. Most of these drugs include oxybutynin, uh, atomoxetin, riboxetin, and uh, because they are anti-muscurinic, they also cause urinary hesitation, dry mouth, and headache. There have been, again, very short-lived studies on these, but they have shown to decrease AHI even to the tune of 29 to 8 events per hour. So what is the alternative approach to all of this? The alternative approach is, if we cannot target the pathophysiological mechanism, let's suppress the symptom. And amongst the system, symptom, one of the most bothering symptoms is excessive daytime sleepiness, which can persist despite CPAP in 6 to 15 percent patients. You see these patients again, you titrate them well, you ensure that you are adequately covering all the events at night, yet the patient says that I still not feel refreshed in the morning. Now when the excessive daytime sleepiness persists, we can target that directly. And the class of the drugs that can be used include cannabinoid type 
one and two receptor agonists like dronabinol, selective S3 receptor antagonists like pitolicent, dopamine noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors like solriamfetol, then dopamine reuptake inhibitors like modafinil or the alerting drug, and again one more reuptake inhibitor of dopamine which is armodafinil. Modafinil and armodafinil are quite utilized. Um, it also uh, has been utilized um, over the counter sometimes, which is one big problem with this drug. However, it can target excessive daytime sleepiness. So, what the cannabinoid agonists do is they increase the vagal activity, while pitolicin type H2 receptor antagonists promote wakefulness. And the same is with the modafinil group. In the right dosages, um, there are several RCTs, almost 10 RCTs with modafinil and 5 with armodafinil that have been seen for even up to 12 weeks. So we have a more longer kind of data in these drugs. They have been shown to decrease excessive sleepiness score, effort sleepiness score also. But the side effects of headache, nausea, insomnia, and dizziness have been reported. And several times patients have to even withdraw the drug because of the side effects. So the right patient choice really matters here. So this is all about the drugs that are available for pharmacological treatment in OSA. Remember, I have still not talked about the newest addition in treatment of OSA pharmacologically. And I will be making a video on that shortly. If you have any more suggestions for any videos on OSC series, please let me know in the comment section. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy reading.